So we're going to talk today about depression, anxiety, and stress. Uh, and, the, you know, these are complex problems, as we know. There's a lot of different things that go into it, including a lot of social pressures and, and social dynamics and so forth. But what we're going to concentrate on today is really looking at it from the biological perspective and metabolic perspective. And we're going to look at how we might be able to utilize some of the new omics approaches to help us better manage and more comprehensively manage uh, these somewhat difficult uh, conditions. Um, let me see if I can get my slides going here. There we go. Okay. So just uh, it, this was said in in my intro, but just uh, disclosures. I'm the chief medical officer of Diagnostic Solutions Laboratory in the diagnostic laboratory space and in the nutraceutical nutri nutritional supplement space for health practitioners. I'm the CMO of Designs for Health. So, you know, the whole gut-brain connection has been a really hot topic for several years now, and uh, that that whole context is used in a, in a lot of different ways, and, and, and it's framed in a lot of different manners, but uh, today we're truly going to talk about a gut-brain connection as it relates to brain functionality when it comes to mood, anxiety, stress, hypervigilance, and other types of uh, uh, central nervous system difficulties and dysfunction. And while on the surface, it seems that, you know, connecting the gut with the brain seems kind of out there and abstract, it's really not when you look at the biology. When you consider that, you know, the gut has its own independently operating nervous system known as the enteric nervous system, uh, that kind of takes care of general housekeeping with gut function all by itself. It doesn't really need the central nervous system to tell it what to do. Um, it has interaction with the central nervous system. And in, in fact, they're kind of in a partnership. So a lot of people have referred to the gut as the second brain for that reason. And then we have all these different neurotransmitters and neuroactive chemicals that are at play in the central nervous system and the brain. These are the same ones that are in play in the enteric nervous system in the gut. So it makes sense that there would be some crosstalk between the two. And then we have this direct anatomical wiring uh, connection between the two in the form of the vagus nerve. So uh, we're learning more and more about the vagus nerve and, uh, and its function and its dysfunction and how that's related to various disorders, including POTS and dysautonomia. It's big time in play in something like long haul COVID. Um, and we don't have time to get fully, we can, we can do a whole seminar on the vagus nerve, but uh, we're gonna talk about it a little bit today in various contexts. But in the gut environment, the microbial uh, composition and then the ecology that's going on there and the metabolomics that are spun off from all of these different microbes going about their business, this has direct influence over neurotransmitters, uh, things like serotonin, things like GABA. Um, these We're going to look at how these microbes can change cytokine expression and create an inflammatory or a anti-inflammatory stance in the gut, which affects mood. We know that depression has very specific, uh, very kind of predictable uh, inflammatory cytokine patterns. These bacteria that live there produce various types of molecules that uh, can influence not only the enteric nervous system, but the brain and the central nervous system from various fatty acids to neurotransmitters, as we said. Um, and uh, it's just a, a really kind of a complex network that's going on in play here. And it's been shown in the literature um, many, many times over, very reproducible, that people that have dysfunctional stress responses or HPA axis abnormalities, altered behavior and mood, things like increased pain perception and hypervigilance generally have dysbiosis. They have imbalances or not particularly favorable compositions of the microbiota in the gut, uh, which have abnormal metabolomic type of signatures associated with them, whether that is production of stress hormones like catecholamines, neurotransmitters. Um, there's generally gut dysfunction. There's low grade or even overt inflammation and ultimately tissue damage in the gut and and potentially even in the central nervous system, where you don't see those things nearly as often in people with very good HPA function, normal behavior, normal mood, and normal pain perception. And we're gonna 
take apart this paper because this is really an incredible paper. I really uh, urge anybody interested in this topic to pull this paper and actually read it. Uh, it, it was published in the Harvard Review of Psychiatry um, in 2020, and it's called Gut It, Unraveling the Role of the Microbiome in Major Depressive Disorder. And this paper is a great one to use as the linchpin of our presentation because it's really a, a very uh, comprehensive review of the literature on this topic. So it really sucks in all of the relevant uh, objective information in in the uh, in the medical databases into this one paper, so it kind of corrals it all for you. So we're going to look at some separate papers, but we're going to lean on this one a lot. And they make an interesting point in this paper that you know microbiology and psychology and psychiatry these are two very separate worlds, and they they don't intersect very often, but they have intersected in the past. Of course, the syphilis causing microbe. Treponema pallidum was responsible for filling, uh, you know, large parts of Victorian mental asylums, uh, and and that that kind of connection mystery was finally figured out. Uh, later on, you saw psychiatrists like Henry Cotton, medical director of the New Jersey State Hospital at Trenton. He was convinced that bacteria and microbes had a lot to do with psychiatric conditions, and he was very centered on oral um, health and the role of the bacteria around the teeth and the gums. Uh, in playing a role in psych psychiatric conditions. And he's a very strong advocate of oral health and probiotics, uh, for instance, in the treatment of such conditions. And then later on still, we had the demonstrated neurocognitive effects of HIV infection. These became very evident and psychiatry once more saw this connection with microbiology. And it's back again, because now as we can really unravel a lot of things from a very scientific objective method with how we can look at the microbiome and the microbiota specifically, we can now prove connections and prove associations and even prove, prove causality in many cases uh, of things that were only sort of surmised or arrived at by empirical observation by early scientists uh, like Meshnikov. Of course, Meshnikov was a Russian pathologist and zoologist sixth ever Nobel laureate in 1908, the father of the orthobiosis theory, which basically says if the gut's healthy and everything's sound there and all the microbes are happy and healthy, then the person or the organism is happy and healthy. And when it goes wrong, the opposite is true. So he's also kind of the father of the dysbiosis theory. And he's the strong advocate, the first real strong advocate in Western medicine of probiotic therapy. But even though this was sort of, you know, this is kind of older world stuff, it's proved out to be true when the science actually got to the point where we were able to really, through the Human Microbiome Project, and then very, very targeted work within the GI microbiota itself with molecular technologies uh, to be able to really learn a lot more about what is truly different compositionally uh, in, in the gut, in, uh, in those with uh, mood disorders, stress and anxiety versus those that do not have it. And not only what microbes may be different, uh, may be over or underrepresented, but what compounds or chemicals are they uh, creating uh, through their metabolism that also may be altering the clinical scenario. And there's, if you search the medical literature, you'll find many fine, very well done studies looking at the microbiota composition in patients with things like major depressive disorder, anxiety disorders, uh, and other types of uh, conditions, whether it's by looking at those issues specifically, like there's studies that will look at what's different about the microbiota in people with depression or with anxiety. But in many times you'll see from some of the studies we'll look at, it's looking at things like irritable bowel syndrome or things like classic fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, these complex chronic disorders that have depression, anxiety, hypervigilance, and mood disorder as a major component of those disorders. So as you study those disorders, you can see which symptoms may change, may get better, may get worse with various therapeutics. Uh, and you can, you can make some of those determinations even if you're not studying depression per se. So this study, you know, makes some really 
strong associations and direct linkage actually between changes in the microbiota and changes in HPA function, changes in stress physiology, change in stress tolerance. And even they talk about studies that involve administering organisms orally, such as Citrobacter rodentium, Campylobacter jejuni, that, that actually can create depression, create anxiety in animal models. Um, and, and it directly shows that you can alter the GI microbiota and even make a healthy, previously healthy subject actually have mood disorders and depression and anxiety. And the reverse, you can you know, change what's going on in the gut ecology, the microbiotic composition and the metabolomics of the gut and actually alleviate some of these conditions as well. So, you know, to wrap up the intro here, we have, you know, this gut ecology, which is very complex, as we know, and we have that microbiota in there, which is alterable and changeable by things such as dietary consumption, for sure. So what, what energy or food substrates are we giving the microbiota? And it will favor some and not favor others. And that's how we can push the microbiota around for the better or for the worse. Certainly drugs play a role, stress plays a role, other lifestyle factors all play a role. And if things are leaning toward not a great state of affairs in a dysbiotic situation, you can get inflammatory cytokines, you can get immune system activation, activation of neural circuits and neuro excitation and abnormalities in the HPA axis function, where when people have a more balanced gut ecology and a good state of affairs from a metabolomic standpoint in the gut, then you don't have those types of symptoms nearly as frequently. So in this paper uh, that we talked about, this gutted paper in the Harvard Review, they pick apart and will list for you in tables and go into exhaustive detail uh, of a lot of the studies, the best studies that have been done looking at depression, uh, but looking also at other disorders that have compression, depression as a component and you'll see that there, there's commonality between a lot of these studies and there's some divergence, right? Because we're dealing with lots of bacteria here, big numbers, a lot, a lot of deep data analysis using machine learning and so forth. So it's not exactly the same in every study, but it does show some common things. You'll see various genus of organisms, uh, Ruminococcus, Prevotella, Fecalobacterium, Dialister, uh, Bacteroides, and things like that being pretty typically low or high, uh, depending on which organism we're talking about. And changes in diversity and changes in, in microbial richness in the gut. But another thing that becomes quite apparent in most of these studies is an elevation of inflammatory compounds, so cytokines. Uh, IL-6 is, is very well known to be upregulated in depressed patients. IL-8, TNF-alpha, CRP, and then shifts in metabolomic markers like uh, the kynurenine tryptophan ratio we'll talk about uh, and how we can use that to assess some of these patients and try to figure out what we can do to help them. But I do want to caution from getting so granular that you can't see the forest through the trees. It's really not about trying to look at this research and say, this specific organism is too low, this specific organism is too high, and down the line, because it's just very, very hard to do that. And we don't have the ability to therapeutically alter things like that, organism by organism, genus and species, you know, and that specifically, we do not have targeted therapies that are that uh, scalpel-like, at least at this point, because many of these organisms are anaerobic organisms or facultative organisms that are just, they're not amenable to putting in a capsule or a pill and giving orally. So we have to use sort of a wider lens, climb up at a little bit higher elevation, looking at the gut ecology, microbial composition, the signature of the metabolome and cytokines and things like that, and kind of look at it from a bigger picture perspective. But there's no doubt that using therapeutic agents that we commonly use in integrative and functional medicine and clinical nutrition can really move the dial in these patients with depression, with anxiety, with mood disorder, 
um, in a favorable way. And again, this study got it looks at this and you know takes a deep dive through all of the literature out there on a whole laundry list of different probiotic organisms, genus, species, strain specific. Um, and once again, you can get lost in the weeds very quickly in this kind of um, review paper and this kind of study data. And again, I'll encourage people to look at the big picture. What is the big picture? Probiotics, beneficial organisms, keystone organisms, you know, fortifying those, making sure they're robust enough is very effective and therapeutic. But I'm not a fan of trying to find the perfect probiotic or the perfect solo violinist, if you will, down to the genus, species and strain level. I really think it's it's an orchestra. It takes an orchestra. It takes a multitude of beneficial organisms, organisms that signal to the enteric nervous system, signal to the enteric immune system to be in a state of balance and to signal against a runaway amplified immune response and inflammation. Uh, prebiotics as well. They, they not only dive into probiotics, they dive into prebiotics. And I just showed a couple here, such as short chain uh, fructooligosaccharides, uh, this was, again, is not a depression study per se, it's an irritable bowel syndrome study, but when they were tracking these things and different therapeutic uh, interventions, uh, short-chain fructooligosaccharide prebiotics actually improved anxiety and depression scores. And probably the most, you know, uh, robust, uh, biggest hammer we have, if you will, to change compositionally the microbiota is fecal microbial transplantation. And there's some good data on that as well. Again, mainly done in IBS because IBS just gets so much attention and, and uh, research when it comes to the microbiota and, and actually looking at the gut uh, because it is fundamentally a gut disorder, gut diagnosis, but it has mood disorder, fibromyalgia, or, or uh, depression and anxiety as a major component. So all those things get tracked. And FMT therapy from healthy donors has been shown consistently to improve depression and anxiety in subjects with IBS. And they even go a little further in here. They look at studies where both mice and rats received fecal microbial transplantation from depressed humans. And that these animals go from normal to also displaying altered mood and behavior, anxiety-like behavior, depression-like behavior, inability to, to uh, experience and appreciate pleasure. Um, these are all things that can be induced in these animals from taking components of the microbiota from humans with these disorders and transplanting them into these animals. So I said it's a big picture. And when we look at it from the big picture, what all of these studies basically show there's a trend in the microbiomes of depressed patients and not only humans, but animals uh, with increased depressive behavior, including anxiety. And that is a drop in alpha diversity. So they don't as, have as diverse of a array of microbes making up the composition uh, of the microbiota. They have an increase in the relative abundance of microbes that are associated with a pro-inflammatory state. So there are some microbes that we know kind of can induce inflammation. There are some very common opportunistic organisms that overgrow. We'll look at some lab tests, you know, strep, uh, staph, some of the organisms commonly associated with uh, immune amplification, autoimmunity like Klebsiella, Citrobacter, uh, and the like. And, uh, these are usually associated with a heightened state of inflammation in the host. Now, great, what can we do about that? Well, you know, the microbiome is a big furnace to fuel cytokine abnormality and systemic inflammation. Inflammation that goes way beyond just the gut and can affect just about everything in the body, including the central nervous system. And central nervous system inflammation is highly implicated as being causal in depression that depression is really not just simply a low serotonin state, or a low GABA state or anything like that, that all plays a role, uh, but inflammation is really underpinning it. And much of that inflammation could be driven through gut mechanisms and with fundamental dysfunction lying in alterations in gut um, microbial signatures. So 
linking the human gut microbiome to inflammatory cytokine production capacity has been a hot bit of research and it's super in play in this topic. And it even goes beyond this topic. There's some incredible papers out uh, as we looked at the gut microbiota and the gut health relationship to COVID-19, uh, both acute and long haul. But it became very apparent very quickly. And we we were onto this very early because at DSL, you know, we're, we're a molecular shop. We're a high-tech quantitative molecular shop. And when the pandemic first happened, FDA reached out and they said, listen, you know, the CDC test is not working. We need to go to industry, particularly labs with high molecular talent, and we needed to develop PCR testing because we don't have it. Uh, we don't have the bandwidth. So we pivoted the whole molecular, you know, department on to developing, you know, respiratory PCR, you know, nasopharyngeal swab technology in-house and we were in that first group of 30 labs that got uh, emergency use authorization. And we ended up doing a, a lot of the COVID-19 PCR testing in the for many of the big hospitals in the uh, Southeastern United States. Um, but parallel to that, you know, we really did our, made our chops on GI testing and using quantitative PCR and molecular on stool samples. So we, we developed a method for SARS-CoV-2 in stool and it was the only one in the world, at least for a while, uh, for a long time, actually. Um, so we were screening any of the federally approved trials that were allowed to continue. We were screening the, the fecal microbial transplant um, uh, material to make sure it didn't have SARS-CoV-2. We were working with municipal governments and public health organizations and counties and municipalities surveying the penetration of SARS-CoV-2 in the population by looking at quantitative SARS-CoV-2 in the sewage as a surrogate marker. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. And it became very apparent you can find SARS-CoV-2 in the gut before you can find it in the respiratory um, uh, system. And then long after the patient recovers and it's no longer detectable in the respiratory system, you can still find it in the gut for quite a while. And the people that go on to develop long haul syndrome, you can find it in the gut persistently. And if not full viral intact replicating viruses, at least spike protein in the enterocytes. So, but the gut microbiota can actually modulate antiviral type one and three interferon responses which can regulate your outcome in a viral infection. So, and this is beyond the gut. This is, uh, you know, systemically that the gut microbiota actually controls homeostatic IFN tone and can change your infection naive immune status and ability to fight a viral infection. So the people with good gut systems and ecology did much better in COVID when they got SARS-CoV-2 acutely than those who did not. So that is why when we look at a lot of different conditions and certainly depression, anxiety, stress, mood disorder is uh, falls into that category, we look at not only the stool and the, and the microbiota, looking for inflammatory dysbiotic states, looking for some shifts and some things that we'll talk about specifically coming up. And you can see in this um, part, partial uh, GI map report, you can see things like staph and strep overgrowth. These are inflammatory organisms. Um, we see overabundance in Bacteroidetes phyla, which is inflammatory. See some changes in commensal organisms and then overt potential autoimmune triggering inflammatory driving type of organisms like Klebsiella here. But also, we see cytokines upregulated on our CytoDX test. So we have a serological cytokine test known as CytoDX. We're using it a lot in a lot of different conditions. Now we're using it a lot in long haul COVID, of course. But you can see here that uh, you have a lot of inflammatory cytokines lighting up here and a strong imbalance toward pro-inflammation versus anti-inflammation, things like you know, uh, IFN gamma, um, things like IL-2, IL-6, uh, RANTES or CCL5. Um, so we're looking at these tests in tandem quite frequently. Again, sort of a multi-omics approach. Now, one of the best tools we have when there is inflammatory cytokines, when there is an inflammatory dysbiosis, is the use of probiotics. And that is something that that uh, review paper uh, strongly 
showed uh, through various different research groups and various different peer-reviewed publications and very high index journals, probiotics really act more than anything else as immune modulators and enteric immune signaling agents. They are anti-inflammatories. So a lot of people have the wrong impression of probiotics from way, way back that when you take a pro oral probiotic like lactobacillus or bifidobacteria species and so forth, that you're reseeding the gut. They even use that terminology in the four or five R program in functional medicine, reseeding or repopulating. In reality, you're not really doing much repopulating and reseeding when you take a probiotic. The numbers of these organisms compared to the overall GI microbiotic composition is like, you know, truly pouring a glass of water in the Pacific Ocean. And you're not fundamentally changing those numbers very much. You can change them to the point where you can see the difference on the stool test with quantitative PCR while you're taking the probiotic. If you stop, the body tends to go back to its default microbiota sort of uh, stance or, or, um, or percentage of organisms when it comes to commensals uh, very, very quickly, actually, unless you're modifying diet or doing something. But it doesn't take a lot of probiotic to actually send the right signals for the gut's nervous system and particularly cytokine to behave to get into a better stance, to get less inflammatory. So on the commensal or normal bacteria section on the GI map, when you see things like low commensals, low normal bacteria, low bacteroides, low here uh, uh, benign E. coli, Fecalobacterium prusnitzii, a very, very important one, low lactobacillus, you want to give probiotics for sure, but it's not just about bringing these numbers up and making the test not low anymore. That's all fine and well and good. But what you're really doing is setting signals to the immune system of the gut, mucosal immune system, to actually do different things when it comes to cytokine production. And it pushes it out of the pro-inflammatory kind of runaway state. So... Keystone species, really important commensals like Acromantia mucinophilia plays a big role in barrier integrity by modulating the breakdown of muc uh, mucus polysaccharides. So it's that it maintains that protective lining along the gut. Clostridia and then Fecalobacterium prusnitzii, both very important producers of short chain fatty, fatty acids, including butyrate. Fecalobacterium prusnitzii has significant amount of information on it relating to a whole host of gut problems, including the two we were just talking about, gut alterations in long-haul COVID, but also in depression and anxiety. So the enterotype that you really see in these depressed patients, patients with mood disorder, patients with uh, neuropsychiatric issues, anxiety, panic attack, insomnia, right across the line, um, is lower bacterial load and relatively low abundance of certain bacterial genuses that do something beneficial. In this case, they're talking about Fecalobacterium prusnitzii. Fecalobacterium is a butyrate producer, and it has ramifications on enteric health in a broader sense. But if you want to look even from a little bit higher elevation, you really need to back up beyond the individual organism level and go to the phyla level. And phyla, of course, means family in scientific uh, you know, language here. And what you see is elevated levels of total DNA of all of the organisms in the Bacteroidetes phyla and a reduction of those in the Firmicutes phyla. And the Bacteroidetes phyla is associated with increased inflammatory stance while Firmicutes anti-inflammatory stance. So when we look at GI maps, for instance, and we see a pattern like you see here. Again, low, some of the commensal organisms being low or borderline low, including overtly low Fecalobacterium prusnitzii, that important butyrate producing keystone organism. And then at the phyla level, we see elevated Bacteroidetes and low for Mickeytes, even though it's not so imbalanced here that the ratio between the two is reported as abnormal. This is the kind of pattern you need to look for in people with depression, anxiety, and mood disorder. Again, elevated Bacteroidetes, lower for Mickeytes, 
uh, low fecalobacterium prusnitzii, a general dysbiotic state leaning toward inflammation. This is a just a newer graphic presentation of the GI map. You're going to see uh, very, very shortly when you're getting your GI map reports back in certain sections like the commensals, like opportunists, you're gonna see not only the raw data like we've been reporting for a very long time, but you will see these sort of visual, color-coded visual analog scales here. And you'll see here again, we have a low fecalobacterium prusnitzii and, uh, and alterations here, at least this is sort of a little bit of an opposite scenario where there's low bacteroidetes, but uh, you still have the low fecalobacterium prusnitzii. Um, so probiotics are very important. Uh, again, not a fan of trying to find the uh, the all-star single probiotic organism. I really am a fan more of an orchestrated kind of effect because um, these things work in a network. And uh, this is a probiotic called ProBioMed. Uh, it comes in ProBioMed 100, ProBioMed 50, that's, and the number is the billion, you know, 100 billion CFU, 50 billion CFU. comes in a in a stick pack with 250 um, billion CFU. This is a probiotic that was very, very well researched and designed by really looking at across a lot of different organisms. We settled on 10 that are genus, um, they're, they're uh, specific right down to the string. So you can see here, um, they're listed and we evaluated them a very strict criteria across the board in a matrix from their ability to uh, survive low pH and transit when you swallow it to get to where they need to go without being uh, wiped out, their bioelastic tolerance, their mucosal adherence, you want good mucosal adherence. We looked at uh, LND lactic acid production ability and very importantly, their immunomodulatory properties from a cytokine standpoint. And we settled on 10 very strain specific organisms to put together into this suite in this nice uh, probiotic um, product. So that's that's a design for health product called Pro ProBioMed. Um, but the use of probiotics is not, it's not a new concept in depression. Um, over a hundred years ago, George Porter Phillips put forward the concept of treating what they called melan melancholia, which is depression in the day, with lactobacillus. So it's kind of an advocate of, of things being uh, discussed by Metchnikoff and, and others. But now we just know a whole lot more about these things and we have a lot more data and research on them. Um, also, um, we use sim, uh, symbiotics a lot where you combine probiotics with, with prebiotics. So one of the conventional problems with prebiotics is they tend to be starches, fruit oligosaccharides, things like that. And people, particularly if they have dysbiosis or they, if they have overgrowth of opportunistic organisms, whether you want to call it SIBO or dysbiosis, whatever you want to call it, and you give them prebiotics, you often can make them more symptomatically because those organisms that are overgrowing there, they usually have low stomach acid, low pancreatic exocrine output, and they just they grab those starches and they ferment it and they produce a bunch of gas. You get distension, you get achiness or pain and flatulence and other types of things. So um, in really a many, many, many year search for the most effective but least symptom uh, aggravating prebiotic, one of the best ones is xylo-oligosaccharide and you have to use much less dosing. Uh, just down at about a gram is more than enough. You don't need to use the very, very high levels you need to with some other uh, prebiotics. Uh, this is called Pretix, and it's in uh, a prebiomed XOS from DFH. So this is a symbiotic product. Uh, things like Saccharomyces uh, cerevisiae boulardii, um, or boulardii, I should say Saccharomyces cerevisiae boulardii, uh, or what people used to just call uh, SACB or Saccharomyces boulardii. Uh, this, of course, is a brewer's yeast. It is technically, it's not a starch, not a fruit of the saccharide. It's a, it's a yeast, but it's technically, and in the regulatory category in the U.S., as a prebiotic because it will, um, it will um, promote the growth of beneficial organisms such as lactobacillus, bifidobacteria, and, and other uh, beneficial keystones. And it can really uh, do other things. We know, you know, to use with antibiotics, it reduces uh, post-antibiotic diarrhea. It's anti-C uh, difficile. It kind of consumes the 
the toxins produced by C. difficile, um, it can bind and kind of neutralize E. coli, salmonella, and others. So it has a whole host of uses. It's a drug in Europe used for antibiotic-associated diarrhea, but it can also be used in mood disorders as a prebiotic and a beneficial organism. Diet plays a role, of course, because the diet is the food and energy substrate for not only the, the person eating it, but for the microbial organisms living in the gut. And you can favor some and favor others based on different kinds of dietary substrates. So um, the diet, you need to look at a couple of things. First of all, it has to be high in folate and vitamin B12 or cobalamin because these, of course, are very important in methylation and production of neurotransmitters. So vegetarians, vegans, for instance, can go vitamin B12 deficient if they're not uh, very careful. Uh, so um, lots of dark green leafies and, and food with folate B12 is good. But from an actual dietary construct here, uh, most of the literature tends to land somewhere around the Mediterranean diet because of the the beneficial fibers in the diet, the fish in the diet for the omega-3 and omega-6 fatty acids. So Mediterranean diet seems to be where things land for a favorable microbiota, favorable mood, uh, at least in these studies. But, you know, whenever we can do this stuff with food and not pills, I'm, I'm a fan of that. So things like probiotic-rich foods, prebiotic rich foods are making a real comeback. And I think that's a good thing. I, I find patients are much more knowledgeable about these now. They're commonly using them. If not, they're open to trying them. Um, and they like that whole concept of trying to use whole foods to do it whenever possible. Sometimes it's just not possible. And we have to use, you know, uh, things that are more targeted, maybe more powerful, maybe more potent, maybe not available in foods in, in pill form and other types of forms. Resistant starches can be very helpful, uh, particularly um, RS type 1 and 2. So starches from beans, legumes, uh, uh, safe grains, nuts, seeds, potatoes, bananas, plantains, these are all really good for the microbiota. But once again, they can cause some bloating and distension and problems in people who have dysbiosis. So sometimes you need to treat the dysbiosis and kind of get the gut in a little bit better state of being receptive to these types of prebiotic therapies. This is a great, you know, uh, prebiotic if you're not doing it with food. Uh, this is uh, uh, Paleo Fiber RS, I believe, in the DFH line. And it's a, just a, a good combination of very high quality resistant starches. Or you can use polyphenol blends. Now, this is kind of using the dietary approach, but in a nutraceutical form. And there is a lot of plant polyphenols that we know have very, very positive effects, not only on the microbial composition, but what they do metabolically, uh, what those organisms do metabolically when they're giving some of these po plant polyphenols as substrates. So here you see wild blueberry, cranberry, pomegranate, quercetin, sulforaphane, and broccoli, uh, a really cool red grape powder concentrate called vinia grown in cell culture. So it's not just resveratrol, it's all the full family of polyphenol and, and delta tocotrienols. This is a brand new product um, and, uh, and uh, it's uh, from Designs for Health. And it's a, it's a really, really nice product. I worked on this with Tom Fabian to do all the translational science and, uh, and uh, uh, give it a look. Um, so again, if you have dysbiosis, though, you have a lot of overgrowth of opportunistic organisms, including some of these inflammatory ones, you certainly may need to look at natural GI antimicrobial options. So things like this is GI uh, Microbex, which is a very, very, very good GI natural antimicrobial that's been around a long time. I formulated it the first time about 15 or almost 20 years ago, but I've changed it a multitude of times based on what we see coming off the stool analysis and trends in the microbiota and research. So you see, you know, various high berberine containing botanicals here, um, including uh, Arctostaphylus uber ursi, Berberus vulgaris, uh, Berberus aquifolius, but um, Artemisia as well, um, and uh, citrus, grapefruit seed extract, caprylic acid, Juglans nigra, or black walnut, but also Tribulus terrestris, which is a wonderful GI antimicrobial, even though it's known for other reasons. Typically in Western herbology, it's actually much more effective as a GI antimicrobial. So 
Uh, this is GI Microbax, and we often, uh, you know, combine that up and co-administer it with a volatile oil like organic oil of oregano. You can't put the volatile oils in with those botanicals because one's in a soft gel oil base, one's powder and capsules. So you have to take two different things, but that's what it takes to cover the full spectrum of organisms you may want to get to. I did want to mention quickly thyroid. Uh, thyroid's very hypothyroid, even if it's subclinical hypothyroidism, very associated with depression, very associated, associated with gut problems because it slows down the motility of the gut. You get IBS-like symptoms. You can get overgrowth and dysbiosis. You get a slower production of hydrochloric acid, pancreatic enzymes. It's just sowing the seeds for a lot of this stuff to happen. So look at thyroid function. This is a patient, for instance, had overtly low T4 markers, uh, very, very functionally low T3 markers, total and free, and even elevated uh, thyroid antibody. So they had, you know, an autoimmune thyroiditis here, probably at Hashimoto's, just wasn't diagnosed yet. And keep in mind that a lot of autoimmune uh, thyroiditis is driven by uh, molecular mimicry to organisms that are overgrowing in the gut and cross-reacting with TSH receptors in the case of Yersenia, but that's certainly not the only organism that can cross-react uh, and drive the immune system to attack the thyroid. You see here in a GI map result, Yersenia enterocolitica being found, but also, interestingly enough, uh, elevated secretory IgA and particularly anti-gliadin secretory IgA which makes sense because we know that gluten gliadin antibody antigen complexes have a strong affinity for the thyroid. We know, for instance, that overt celiac patients have 10 to 20 times the rate of autoimmune thyroid disorders, but in non-celiac gluten sensitivity, there's a much higher incidence of autoimmune thyroid activity. And in fact, when people go on low gluten diets, they're also not only pulling away the antigen itself in gluten and gliadin, but they're actually eating different starches and fibers by making that dietary change, which often has uh, beneficial effects on the microbiota. So when you see the stool chemistry section on GI map showing things like anti-gliadin IgA elevated, calprotectin a bit elevated, and zonulin elevated, this is a person, they have some inflammation along the gut lining. They have barrier dysfunction with a little zonulin going on, so they're getting more antigen penetration through into the uh, to dance with the immune system. And some of this uh, may be being driven by their dietary intake of gluten and gliadin, which has a pro-inflammatory upregulate the innate immune system response in the gut. And they probably have dysbiosis as well. So you may need to hit them with some mucosal uh, barrier function therapy. This is uh, GI Revive powder. This is a mainstay in functional medicine. This is a wonderful product with a whole boatload of different mucilaginous botanicals that uh, block immune am amplification. There's all of the prerequisite nutrients for enterocytes like therapeutic levels of L-glutamine. There's pepsin GI, the zinc carnosine uh, complex that is anti-H pylori, but is also very strongly uh, mucosally healing. There's the glycerized licorice but there's also something called N-acetylglucosamine. And I put that in this product very strategically because of N-acetylglucosamine and the data on it, looking at glycobiology in that this substance can actually get in, it can get in the gears between the antigen being presented by the antigen presenting cell and trying to activate the prime T cell. That these mucopolysaccharides, glycan rich, polymers can get sort of in the in the lock and key. So it's almost like sticking chewing gum in the in the padlock. You can't get the key in to open it. Uh, so these are um, basically blocking the immune system from becoming a runaway train. So using this in, in gut products is very useful. So I put it in another brand new product called uh, IgGI which is a serum-derived bovine immunoglobulin concentrate known as immunolin with really good data on it. So it's bovine-derived, but it's non-dairy. Of course, it's serum-derived. And it's combined not only the IgG, but with N-acetyl-D-glucosamine. So it's called IgGI. It's a really nice product to help with, uh, with, with gut health. Um, exercise. Exercise affects the GI microbiome. 
Um, the most simplistic ways is it increases known probiotics like bifidobacterium lactobacillus. And, but there are a lot of other mechanisms. I've written about this pretty extensively. Uh, this is a paper in the Townsend letter. You can access it over at Townsend or just on my site, drdavidbrady.com in the articles tab. Uh, uh, GI microbes also have been shown to regulate host circadian rhythm. So, you know, people who don't sleep, can't get to sleep, can't stay asleep, don't get refreshed sleep, they get depressed, they get anxious, they, you know, it's a feed forward system and they have a hard time having good mental health. So if you need to use melatonin or sustained release melatonin, or I use these chewable kind of sublingual, very fast acting uh, things called insomnitol chews that give a little payload of melatonin, some 5-HTP, some theanine and inositol and a little P5P to, to make it all buzz. Um, medications used in depression have effects on the GI microbiome and they used to be thought of as side effects, but turns out that the, a lot of them are antimicrobial and the antimicrobial effects of some of these antidepressant classes may actually be what's doing most of the therapeutic good that they're affecting the dysbiosis in the gut and that they're not really acting primarily through their uh, proposed primary mechanism of action, whether that's as an SSRI, SR, SNRI, uh, and so forth. Fluvoxamine is a great example lately of an SSRI with multiple mechanisms of action, uh, and it was used for its effect on the sigma-1 receptor that controls inflammation, and fluvoxamine can really dial down cytokine storms and run away inflammation. Uh, so it is one of the drugs that is used off-label in COVID-19, both acute and long-haul COVID. It's one of the drugs advocated by the um, frontline physicians group. And it's, it's unique to fluvoxamine. This is not a class effect. So uh, other SSNRIs do not have the same multi-mechanism of action effect on inflammation. By the way, fluvoxamine is also a very strong um, uh, blockade, if you will, of histamine released from mast cells. So in mast cell activation syndrome, histamine intolerance, fluvoxamine is a weapon that's starting to be uh, used. The flip side is true. The gut microbiome influences many of these drugs that are used for depression and anxiety. It can clear them quicker, it can clear them slower, it can manipulate them uh, and their metabolites based on the microbial composition. This is a brand new study to me. I just saw it the other day, so I threw it in here, showing uh, that probiotics actually are beneficial uh, as add-on therapy in depression. What does that mean? It means if they're on various classes of antidepressive medications, using probiotics is not detrimental and it's actually beneficial across multiple classes of drugs. So while we've been talking mainly about the microbiota, we use um, urinary and plasma omics. We use metabolomics. And this is the new omics type of profile and also organic acid profile from DSL using the latest methodology in the laboratory. Very, very up to date. If you're used to doing organic acids, uh, most of the tests out there, their methodology is a couple of decades old, uh, as are their markers. This is a whole fresh evidence-based take on metabolomics, organic acids, and really up-to-date technology as well. And it uses some machine learning in the background algorithmically to look at the test results on a patient and comes up sort of with a metabolic score, if you will, from minimal, moderate, or high uh, concern. Uh, and color coded. So you can see this one, uh, high concern is in the stress and mood markers. So, and there's quite a few of these. I mean, we can look at serotonin, serotonin function by 5-HIAA or 5-hydroxy uh, indolic acetic acid. And when it's very, very low, uh, there's probably not a lot of serotonin going on because this is the downstream metabolic ash of serotonin through monoamine oxidase. So very low 5-HIAAs are often associated with depression, insomnia, chronic pain, uh, pain perception issues like in classic fibromyalgia, and elevated levels are often associated with taking various serotonin manipulating medications, um, 5-HTP, lots of L-tryptophan, and so forth. Um, I'm a fan of using 5-HTP to prime serotonin if you need more serotonergic effect. I love precursor therapy. I use it 
even with patients on SSRIs, SNRIs, uh, yeah, blasphemy, uh, serotonin syndrome, all of that. Been practicing 30 years. I've seen serotonin syndrome about twice, uh, and I know how to manage it and follow a patient. So am I concerned about using 5-HTP when they're already on an SSRI? Not particularly if I'm following the patient and monitoring the labs. In fact, that's often exactly what they need because some patients have such low serotonin um, and they're so low in tryptophan and serotonin precursors, they can't make enough serotonin for the drug to be effective because you need a certain amount of serotonin to block the reuptake of or the drug just fails. So a lot of times if you give them some 5-HTP and prime the pump, they, they need a lot less of the drug and they can go down on their prescription or even off of it and get good effects. I am a fan of 5-HTP because it's dedicated towards serotonin versus tryptophan, which could go to serotonin, but it can often go through the kynurenine pathway. And aberrant microbiota and dysbiosis has been shown to actually modulate this and to tend to make tryptophan go the down the inflammatory pathway and produce uh, kynurenate, quinolinate, and others. So you do not want, you know, your tryptophan, you want to go in toward 5-hydroxytryptophan serotonin in a depressed person. You don't want it going toward uh, kynurenate and quinolinate. That, those are very uh, inflammatory and uh, neuroexcitatory types of compounds. So we can dissect this on metabolomics. So this patient here, this is a depressed patient. Their tryptophan is very low. Their 5-HIAA is very low. So their tryptophan, they don't have enough substrate to make enough serotonin, and they're certainly not. You can see with their 5-HIAA being low, that's the direct metabol uh, metabolic ash of serotonin. So where's all the tryptophan going to? Where's it bleeding to? Because they were not tryptophan deficient in their diet. It's going down the inflammatory pathway to uh, kynurenic acid and quinolinic acid. You can see it there. And this is causing alterations in the kynurenine tryptophan or KT ratio uh, and increasing hydroxy uh, kynurenine. So this is a classic inflammatory, neuroexcited, uh, probably depressed patient, probably has some anxiety as well. Keep in mind though that quinolinic acid itself can be increased temporarily by infections, things that drive inflammation, such as having COVID having long haul COVID syndrome. So quinolinic acid can increase anytime interferon gamma is released by macrophages, so viral infections. It is a marker of CNS inflammation. A lot of times when it is elevated, we try to stabilize metabolism. We use fish oils, omega-3 fatty acids in particular, and don't use tryptophan therapy. If you're trying to deal with serotonin, use 5-HTP. Uh, homo vanillic and vanyl mandelaic acid, or HVA and VMA, these are your catecholamine uh, products of the adrenal medulla. If you see these low, this is someone who's usually kind of chronic fatigued, flat out, kind of on the couch, just has no vitality whatsoever. Um, this is very different from a patient where these two markers or one of them is elevated. This is often seen in a state of anxiety, hypervigilance, insomnia, racing mind. You see this in IBS a lot. You see this in uh, classic fibromyalgia. These are really, you know, fight or flight hypervigilance type of patients. So we treat them very, very differently. Um, this patient here has elevated catecholamines, low serotonin ashes, and elevated cortisol. So they are just wired and tired and probably depressed. So this is the classic pattern we see in uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. A uh, couple of great products to address this. Uh, this is the first adrenal calming formula here. This is called catecholicom, by the way, but you can see a lot of gabinergic herbs like lemon balm, passion flower, valeriana, uh, some phosphatidylserine to calm down the uh, membranes, ashwagandha as a uh, one of the few kind of uh, calming adaptogenics. This is with any of somnifera, somnolent sleep, right? And then basically theanine, taurine, and a bunch of phosphorylated B vitamins and C to replete the adrenal glands. Uh, another nice calming adrenal formula, this is uh, Neurocom. 
This utilizes more botanical German chamomile, um, inositol, taurine, L-theanine, some 5-HTP and phosphatidylserine. Um, that, again, this is a very different scenario than if the catecholamines and medullary products are low. Uh, cortisol is low. This is a, a this is a tired and mired patient. The other one was a wired and tired patient. This is a mired and tired. What do you mean by mired? They're mired on the couch. They don't have enough energy to get up and be excited. Uh, they need tonifying adrenal stuff. They need true adaptogens, things like uh, uh, Panax quinquefolius, eleutherococcus, rhodiola, a little bit of tyrosine, licorice, stuff that's uplifting. You don't want to give this kind of formula to someone with the elevated catecholamine ashes like VMA and HVA because you'll make them worse and you'll give them anxiety. GAB is a big player here. Very, very important. As you know, it's the kind of the anti-anxiety kind of feel okay along with serotonin neurotransmitter. And we can look at that right here, either on the organic acid panels or the metabolomic uh, panels from DSL. So when you see a low GABA here, got to look for anxiety, panic attacks, sleep disturbances and the like. And you can actually pull apart all of the glutamine, glutamate, GABA type of biochemistry here by following it down the chain in the metabolomics panel so that you know, uh, is everything being handed off properly? Is there any um, precursor issues you need to address like P5P uh, and so forth? Uh, to support GABAnergic activity, uh, I use PharmaGABA. I tend to either use it in uh, chewable tablets, sublingual, or in a liposomal that has uh, some uh, pharmagaba and L-theanine in it. Um, so this is either pharmagaba or, or liposomal neurocom. And then in the metabolomics, you also get a snapshot of what's going on in the gut. It's not like doing a GI map, but you can get various metabolites uh, of the microbes as they, as they consume and metabolize amino acids, plant polyphenols, isoflavones, and things like that. If you get a lot of dirty, you know, grouping of abnormals and elevations in these sections, this is a chemical sign of bacterial overgrowth in the gut and dysbiosis. Uh, it's really a red flag to make you do a GI map. Uh, Arabinitol on the bottom is specific for candida. And then the final omics piece is genomics. And I don't have a lot of time to get into the genomics, but our genomic insight test at DSL, you know, we do all the sequencing and do all the genomic data acquisition um, with the with our chip. Uh, you send in a buccal swab, but really the, the gold and the magic here is running it through the genomic insights, machine learning, and artificial intelligence, which uses Opus 23. It uses a specific proprietary version of Opus 23 known as Opus 23 Explorer, which is uh, a bit more user-friendly, less training intensive than Opus 23 Pro. But this system goes out, takes your genomic data, and goes and references it to all these different public databases from PubMed ID, Pharmagenomics, Ediome, Keg, uh, ClinVar, GWAS, uh, agent IDs to come up with useful data for you. So if you pull up your data set when you do a genomic insight, and you have a depressed patient or a stress patient or anxiety patient, you can just write in the SNP navigator, which is like Google of SNPs here within Opus, put in catecholamines like I did, and you see all these different SNPs, they just pop right up for you. It's all the COMT uh, SNPs with their RSID numbers, MAO SNPs and so forth, and it will give you your data, the risk allele, is it a risk or a benefit uh, gene and what the client or your data set are you null? Are you heterozygous? Are you homozygous? Is this an area you need to pay attention to? If you don't know what COMT is, you just click on it. It'll tell you what COMT is. COMT, catechol o methyltransferase gene, helps break down neurotransmitters, dopamine, norepinephrine. Certain variants of COMT will cause higher levels of dopamine due to slower breakdown, can contribute to anxiety and insomnia. Individuals be more susceptible to dopamine fluctuations and therefore mood swings. Um, you can look into another gene, M-A-O-A, -A, uh, and if you want to learn about that, this is mono, monoamine oxidase A. Of course, that's a pathway that breaks down neurotransmitters, including serotonin, and alterations along this gene 
uh, SNPs on this gene can lead toward neurotransmitter imbalances that can relate to mood swings, OCD, anxiety, aggression, insomnia, depression, and the like. And it can tell you, you know, hey, you need to nutritionally bolster uh, certain pathways to support their neurotransmitter function. You could look at network mappings, let's say methylation, one carbon metabolism. We know that um, methylation is very important to mood and depression. Um, we know that people with SNPs along, let's say, methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase um, have more depression. And if they're treated with things like folate and methylcobalamin and so forth, they can do much better. Well, this is how Opus in Genomic Insights looks at uh, um, looks at um, one carbon metabolism and methylation. It puts it on a whole metabolic map for you, all color coded, power coded, so you know which genes are having the problem and where they lie on the metabolic map instead of just giving you, let's say, two SNPs, like the, the C677T and the A1298C, which everyone knows. And you get that too, but you get it much more contextualized. But those SNPs here, you can see, One's homozygous, one's heterozygous, and when you, when the software mashes up the, you know, the, the the gene interaction between these various SNPs, with this kind of pattern, you have a 60 to 70 percent reduction in enzyme activity. So you can report this out to the patient, to the client. This this is a client side report in this realm. Shows them exactly how impaired their enzyme may be, and the 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 system you can ask it you know, what do I need to give to address problems along these SNPs? And it shows it to you in an agent map. So if they have problems on methyl tetrahydrofolate reductase, but let's say they also have a heterozygous SNPs or homozygous SNPs on another methylation gene like 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate homocysteine methyltransferase reductase, for instance, you can try to pick agents shown there in the blue because they hit both nodes. They're going to affect both genes. So you can find out what agents can I use to kill more than one bird with one stone. And you can run all the natural agents and what the database says when it goes out to PubMed based on your genetic data and your data set. And you can see here different power bars associated with different natural products. Now, you'll see interestingly on this, just regular B9 folic acid is ranked higher than 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate. Now, as clinicians, we know 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate hydrofolate is the preferred form and the better one to use, but to Opus, it's all about what's in the medical literature and data, and there's just a whole lot more studies on folic acid than there is 5-methyltetrahydrofolate. That's why it gets weighted. If you're a Designs for Health uh, product line user, you can select it to also output these power bars on specific formulations from DFH because the database knows all the products and every single ingredient and the relative levels in it. And you can see here in this methylation issue, the thing that came out most superior was homocysteine supreme, which although it was designed for homocysteine problems, that's a methylation problem and it has, has all the right nutrients in it. Finally, on metabolomics, you can look directly at B12 status by something like methylmalonic acid. And if that, if you're having a problem enzymatically along that metabolism, you'll get a buildup of methylmalonic acid because succinate beta synthase isn't performing very well. Um, and you can see here, this is a high MMA. This person functionally needs B12. Um, this is a much better way of looking at B12 status than serum B12. It's been shown in the literature to be a far superior than waiting for them to become anemic have megaloblastic marrow, macrocytosis, low RBCs, hypersegmentation, low serum B12, MMA is the way to go. FIGLU is the marker we look at for folic acid status, very analogous to the MMA for B12, but for folate. And between the two, you can come up with really good therapeutics. This is mood stasis, combines methylcobalamin with 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate and a couple of botanical extracts that are really good for depression. Uh, Crocus sativus, which is saffron, and scalidium, uh, uh, tortosium. And these are very specific um, materials of those herbals, uh, which have human outcome trials. Uh, Zembrin, which is the scalidium, is not only an SSRI, but it's a PDE4 inhibitor, which not only helps depression, but 
Uh, it's neuroprotective. It helps cognition and so forth. That's called mood stasis. These are just some studies on crocus. What we always strive to do at DSL is to harness the latest in testing technology and provide that to the clinician to be able to manage complex, chronic, multifactorial disorders and certainly mood disorders, depression, anxiety, and stress. And the whole gut brain axis is a big part of that. So by using a multi-omics approach and trying to triangulate here and getting the most data possible to make the best therapeutic decisions is paramount. And we like to do that using non-invasive sampling to make it easy for your patient to collect samples. So in the case of genomics and SNPs, we utilize a buccal swab. In the case of microbiomics for the GI map test, we utilize a stool test or stool sample and metabolomics in small molecules, either if you're doing organic acid testing or full metabolomics, it's generally urine. All you really need is urine. You can add plasma for some of the markers if you'd like, although they're really fine done in urine. It's just there's probably a little bit more literature out there done in plasma because it's been done like that longer. So if you're a provider who's comfortable with phlebotomy, has access to it, and you would like to do the urine plasma combo, that's perfectly fine as well. But by utilizing our genomic insight test, our GI map test, and our urinary organic acid or organic metabolomics, you will be able to get the best of all this testing, get good objective data, make good clinical decisions. And we know that some of this can be a little bit confusing at first, a little bit intimidating, and that's why we offer full clinical and technical support, uh, which is run by clinicians, who uh, have a lot of scientific background in these testing, but they really understand the therapeutic options, and they're very much there to help you. And you'll find that very soon after doing some consults on all of these tests, you won't really need consults very much anymore unless you have a very difficult case. So at the lab, we're really trying to keep the clinician in the future and make them comfortable there and have them not be intimidated and have all the support they need because there's two lanes in healthcare right now. There's pretty much the future and there's the past. And we want you in the future because this stuff, particularly in the laboratory space, is changing rapidly. And uh, it's just something that we all have to be comfortable with and utilize and we'll get better outcomes from it. I wanted to thank you for registering for this webinar and thank you for your time and attention. And I hope it was worth the investment you made. And uh, this is David Brady saying, see you next time.